It's almost as if it was deliberately designed to look ugly. Until you got inside, you realized how fantastically precious it really was. Scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture. Something new every single time. And every single time. All right, all right. So last week, uh, we were in the book of Acts. We went over chapters five and six. And today we'll be trying to press forward into two more chapters, hopefully. If we could cram them in with the time we have. <clears throat> All right, so last week we were left on a cliffhanger from chapter six, right? We saw how there was a dispute between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews about the distribution of food and care, right? So the apostles, uh, had chosen seven guys to wait on the tables of, of the people who were, who were in need of care. And one of these guys was Stephen, okay, who was probably, um, you know, the, the most renowned of the seven. And this guy stood out from the rest in the, in the way that he was teaching and, and God even doing miracles through these seven dudes, right? Stephen gets into a dispute with some of these Jews from a particular synagogue and this whole beef starts to starts to happen with what he's teaching and what he's doing, right? And so obviously we see there's a conflict and I'm just going to read over um, that particular part of, of last week's chapter so that uh, we can begin to pick up off, off of today, right? But anyway, <clears throat> before we get into the word of God, we always want to come before the Lord in prayer and ask him to guide us through the scriptures and invite him uh, to the service. So let's pray. Holy Father, we come to you again in Jesus' mighty name. And Father God, we thank you for allowing us to come together today to seek you, Father, to know you more, to know about you more, and Father, to be known by you. Right now, we invite your presence into this place, Lord God. We ask you that you wash us and cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness, all, un all wickedness, Lord God, all transgression and iniquity, Father, so that we might be blameless and holy in your presence, O God so that you will be pleased to be among us. And Father, we, um, we ask you right now to guide us through your word, to be our teacher, to write these things on our minds and on our hearts as we do every day and every week, oh God. Our Father, you alone are our teacher, as your word says. And so we thank you for, for giving us your words, for allowing us to study for ourselves. And I pray that as we handle your word, Lord God, you will guide our minds, our hearts, our imaginations to understand what you desire for us to know and that uh, you teach us how it is that you speak to us from within us, oh God, and sharing with us what things you desire for us to, to look into and to key in on in every, every time that we have fellowship. And Father, um, again, we just hope that you're pleased with this gathering. I pray that you open the minds and hearts of each and every person uh, who's listening right now. And Lord, uh, again, we give you all the glory and honor. Every time we come together, Lord God, we desire to lift up your name, to bless you, and to give you all the glory. So all these things we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, and so... Um, again, just a quick recap from Acts chapter six, and I'm going to start at verse eight because this is really where, uh, the situation begins, right? Okay. And so it says now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power performed great wonders and signs among the people. 
Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Okay, remember the Sanhedrin is the leading council of the people in, of the religion. Okay, so you had the Pharisees and Sadducees made up the Sanhedrin, right? along with the scribes and, and the priests and everything else, right? So it says, they produce false witnesses who testify, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Okay, and so how awesome is that, right? When you have opposition, persecution coming against you and your composure is still in God, right? When you have such confidence in God and the things that you've been teaching as his truth that you come to know, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to be afraid of these men even though my life is now in their hands, right? Because I put my trust in the God I know who sees me and knows what's really going on here, okay? And especially when you have men producing false witnesses, there's nothing that gives us greater confidence when we know we're standing in the truth, okay? Regardless of what the opposition is saying, right? And so just in the light of Stephen being able to stand there having the face like the face of an angel, right? I want to bring up a, a scripture passage that I have read this week that I thought was just absolutely phenomenal, right? And so if you look into, if y'all want to write this down or just make a note of it, it's the book of Psalms 34 verses four and five. And it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered in shame. Okay, and, and it just so happened to be the verse of the day the other day. And I said, that speaks perfectly of Stephen in this particular situation. Because he trusts in the Lord God. And so his face is not covered in shame and is radiant. All right, just like in the one he's speaking of, right? All right, so now we're picking up from that, right? Now looking at Acts chapter 7, reading out of the NIV, okay? Just for anybody who might be coming in, we're reading out of the NIV so we, we can all be on the same translation with each other. Okay, so Acts chapter 7, starting right from the top. It said, then... The high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? To this, he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. Okay, so when, when asked about the charges that they were bringing up against Stephen, Stephen now has the opportunity to share what he has been sharing the whole time to the people that he's been dealing with, right? And I think it's just absolutely phenomenal that he starts like from the beginning with his own brethren. Like, yo, if we're going to talk about what took place, you guys want to bring me up on charges for the things that I'm teaching? Well, then let me show you what I teach from the beginning. I think this is just awesome. Okay, and, and first and foremost, one thing that we see 
is that Abraham was from the land of the Chaldeans. Okay. And so when you come to think about what that means to think about Babylon, right? Think about Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Who was the king of the Chaldeans, right? Um, and, and Babel and that, and that whole ordeal. Um, if you go back into the book of Genesis, you'll see he was from Ur of the Chaldeans, right? And so God called him to come out of his own people to follow after him. All right. And so the same way that it began for Abraham, so it begins with us, right? God is calling us out of the world, out of our people group, out of where, wherever, in order to be a people that follows after God, to become part of the kingdom of God. All right. So anyway, so it says he gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at, the, at that time, Abraham had no child. Okay. And so God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. God said, and afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. All right, so, so just to cover that, Abraham as a pilgrim, walking through a land that he did not own, that he was not uh, of that people group, that was not his nation or his ethnicity, right? God had him wandering in a foreign land and telling him, this land I'm promising you and your descendants, but didn't give him any portion of it. If you study the book, the, there's only a small portion that Abraham actually owned in, in that land. And it was because he bought a burial ground in order to bury his dead. All right. You guys can study that on your own in the, in, in the book of Genesis. But so the only part that Abraham owned at that, at that time was some land to bury his dead. Right. But knowing that God was going to bring it back because of all of God's promises. Now imagine this also. God tells you, listen, follow me and I will be your God and the God of your descendants. However, know this, your descendants are going to be slaves for 400 years mm. in a foreign country. And then you ask yourself, well, do I really want to get into this relationship with God, with this God? <laughs> All right. And so you could imagine what that must have been like for Abraham. And God tested Abraham in many ways. And Abraham always you know, rose, rose to that, uh, that bar that God set for him. Okay. And so we desire to do the same thing, but to know God, God keeps it real. God doesn't sugarcoat anything. He tells you what it's going to be like. He says, yo, you're going to have to walk through some fire in order for us to, to get to where we're going. Are you ready? Are you ready? So anyway, this is a particular fire that Stephen is now being brought to, right? Stephen comes to faith and then the whole world is against him, just like Jesus said. So what we're seeing here is, is nothing new. All right. <clears throat> so he says, verse eight, then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision and Abraham became the father of Isaac and Isaac circumcised, I'm sorry, and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs, all right? As if these men didn't know this, Stephen's given him this whole history lesson. What's awesome is that now we get it as well by reading this. And to be honest with you, if you study Stephen's address here carefully, there are things here that he says by the Holy Spirit that you will not find in the rest of the scriptures. So keep that in mind. The Holy Spirit now uses Stephen as a mouthpiece to give some commentary on things that we've never uh, received through the word, which is pretty awesome. All right. So he says, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. 
Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who, uh, who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and, uh, and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt where he and his ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. Okay, so remember the reason that Abraham would have his dead brought back to the land that he purchased was, was so that during the resurrection, they believed in the resurrection, that when they rose from the dead, they wouldn't wake up in some foreign land, but they would wake up in the land that God promised their descendants to be able to see the fulfillment of the promises. Okay, and so this is why you see Abraham being buried there. When Joseph, even being in Egypt, says, yo, when Moses... Um, brought the people out of Egypt, he, right? He commanded, before he died, he commanded the patriarchs to bring his body out and make sure they bring it back home when they leave. So there's some very awesome stuff there. But anyway, you can see the, the faith even in these things that they do, right? Okay, so it says 17. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw their own, their newborn babies so that they would die, to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. All right, and so, when you look at this particular passage where it talks about there was a new king that came up that, that Joseph meant nothing to. When you look at what that actually means, um, it's not a new king of the same kind, like the son of the original uh, Pharaoh, but it, what it means is uh, another king, another kind of person comes into play. It's the difference between going from using uh, a pencil to using a pen, right? You have this guy who may have come into power in Egypt through conquering, through conquest, okay? He, he was um, somebody who didn't know the arrangement that Joseph had with the previous king and so on, okay? And so anyway, um, so he began to deal treacherously with the people, right? Verse 20, at that time, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own, as her own son. Okay, so, so here Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house like a, like a grandson, okay? Like the son of his daughter. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Now again, that's some insight to the scriptures because that it don't say that in the book of Exodus. But now the Holy Spirit giving us some insight as to what Moses was actually thinking, right? That, that the people would realize that God was using him to rescue them. That's just awesome. So when he went out to see his people, he knew exactly what the case was. He knew who they were. He knew who he was and where he stood. Okay, so anyway. And it's funny because in order for him to be even thinking that, Moses would have had to be thinking of God, period, at that time. But Moses didn't meet God until the burning bush incident, which takes place like 40 years after this. So there, it's, there's a lot of things to put together when you're reading this, right? But very awesome commentary. All right, so anyway, 
It says, the next day Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? But when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. It says, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight and he went over to get a closer look. He heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge. And it says he was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And so just getting to this point of the dialogue that Stephen's bringing as he's being accused, as he has to answer for a charge, you could already see what he's getting at. He's about to take this very thing and put it on Jesus, right? The same same way they treated Moses, right? He's, he's showing some ill treatment toward Moses, but how God had made him ruler and judge and deliverer. And now he's gonna show how the people did the same thing to Jesus and how Jesus becomes our judge and ruler and deliverer, right? Okay, so, uh, what am I, 36, right? Mm -hmm. So it says, he led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us, right? So the whole deal wasn't going to be about Moses. Moses was already telling the people, God is going to send you a prophet like me, another prophet, right? And he told them that you must obey everything that he tells you. And so anyway, he says, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to worship of the sun, moon, and stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? Oh, he said, do you bring me, right? Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? Right, so it's, it, it, it's kind of messed up because here God delivers them out of all their turmoil in Egypt, only for them to abandon him and give the glory to something that their own hands have made. And even when they made the calf, right? What did they say? Tomorrow, there'll be a feast to the Lord. This is the God that gave, that led us out of Egypt, right? And it's just like how, how fast things can fall apart, okay? Especially without the Holy Spirit. So anyway, 43, it says, you have taken up the tabernacle of Malik and the star of your God, Rephan the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Right? So when Moses was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments from God, 
not only was he receiving those two tablets, but he was also seeing the pattern of something, of the tabernacle, right? And that is, again, to, to show us that what things are done on the earth are a pattern of what things are in heaven, okay? And so the tabernacle that was with Moses received those sacrifices and offerings unto God. There's also one in heaven as well. Keep that in your minds. And so if, if Moses saw that in heaven, well, then who was going to offer something up there? All right. That remains to be seen at this point in the scripture. Right. But anyway, so it said after receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations uh, God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And so now, you mm. see, Stephen goes off from quoting the scriptures and enters now into his address to these people. And by, by the way of the Holy Spirit, giving him the words to say, this man say, you stiff-necked people people mm. with uncircumcised hearts and ears, right? Man, you always resist the Holy Spirit. And check this out, 52. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. And so again, this is like, if you were looking to gain some favor with your audience, you're not doing well, right? <laughs> It says, you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. It said, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And remember what we mentioned about the right hand, right? It's a place of honor and a place of power with God, okay? So now Jesus is given the name above every name because of his obedience to the Lord God, right? And God had him to sit down at his right hand. And so <clears throat> 56, it says, look, he said, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Okay. It said, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Okay, and so again, Stephen is well known for being like the first martyr, all right, to Jesus Christ in scripture. And the word martyr actually means a witness, right? So we know if we're talking about technically witnessing, we saw Peter do that a couple times already, right? But anyway, at this point, we see somebody who gave up his life, right, uh, for the truth of God. And and so, you know, we see Jesus was the original, right? We could say um, who, after ushering um, the Holy Spirit, he's the one that kicks open the door. Jesus is the one that kicks open the door. But if we believe what Stephen has been telling us, right, the people been killing God's prophets. There were so many men who already had their blood shed for being obedient to God. And, and so, you know, all these men waiting 
waiting for God to do something, right? Anyway, you see here it says, um, they, the men that were doing the stoning laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So these guys were, before they picked up rocks, it's just like how we are sometimes on the street about to fight somebody. Well, let me take off my jacket first before you get into a scuffle, right? Saying that's what we used to do, that's not what we do anymore. <laughs> but anyway, so they took off their jackets and laid them at Saul's feet. Now, Saul is a guy that we know of as Paul, right? He's, he's uh, one who is responsible for most of the books in the New Testament, okay? So at this time, he's referred to as Saul, and he was giving approval to Stephen being stoned, okay? Um, he was a Pharisee uh, at this time and was going about believing that he was doing God's work by snuffing these men out, right? And so, and let's take a note again as to what Stephen says in the very end. Even though these men have falsely accused him, produced false witnesses, right? Were, were coming against the truth that he was speaking and then picked up stones to stone him. Before he falls asleep, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, okay? And so we hope to demonstrate that same level of spirit, of faith and conviction that no matter what happens to us in this world, right, we will not become hardened uh, because of the world, but that we would be like God, we'd be like Jesus, be like the Holy Spirit, be like Stephen, who's able to forgive, right? Even when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And so that same spirit that was in Jesus is demonstrated in Stephen, right? Forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. Okay? And so just like Jesus told us, man, love your enemies, right? Pray for those who persecute you. This man is emulating this behavior perfectly. All right? And so moving on to chapter 8, right from the top. It says, and Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Okay, so it's interesting when you see how a lot of times, you know, there's like a thick atmosphere, right? In the room, but you'll see some people, they're not gonna they're not gonna be the first ones to say something. But then once somebody says something, everyone else wants to chime in and, 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 and now add their opinions in on, on what they felt about it in the first place. You see, that's that's all it took was this one incident to pop off that gave approval of Stephen's death. And then, boom, persecution breaks out all over the city. And now Christians are, are in danger everywhere, right? And so, you know, if you study the Old Testament, you study in the book of Exodus when God gives the law, he commands people not to be a part of a mob, right? Not to throw in your lot with the crowd who goes off to do wickedness or to do evil. But we see the nature of these people complete opposite of what God had desired to make them into. You know, God gave his law that it might conform us to be like him. And, you know, but more and more without the Holy Spirit, you know, we're destined for failure always. We have no power to overcome the nature that, that is in us, right? This is why Jesus came to give us his Holy Spirit. But anyway, so it says, verse two, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So even though there was persecution, people, they're not stopping the move. Okay, and that takes true faith, true conviction. All right. And anyway, think about this now for yourselves, right? When they come to your door and drag you out because of your faith, what are you going to do? Mm. Okay. So this is this is some awesome things for us to be reading right now because this world is coming closer and closer to those days where they're going to cast off whatever uh, feelings they have about their unity and their vision for the world or whatever. And that vision 
is going to put us in the ground. That vision needs to take us off of the board because we are the ones that speak out against those things that they legislate, those laws that they pass that will try to force us to do the things that they want us to do, right? By default, our faith stands against those things. And so, you know, they're going to take the Bibles out of schools, right? You saw that. Take the prayers out of schools, take, take the commandments off the courthouses, you know, take all the history of those things out from the nation so that they can start to make the image of their God, the image of their culture and empire. And that there's no room for us in that, you know? If things continue to go on that course, we'll be the next ones to get dragged out. So anyway, uh, verse five, it says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. So again, remembering that when people are seeing preachers out there, yeah, that's all well and good. Sometimes the message is awesome, right? But when they are accompanied with signs and wonders, that's how you, you saw the fingerprint of God on this person. And, and that made their message all the more real and true. If, if this man is out here doing these things that he must be sent from God, so then I can put my faith in what is what he's saying. And he's proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, right? So anyway, verse seven, it says, for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Okay, people who had serious ailments being healed by the Holy Spirit working through Philip, right? So there was great joy in that city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God, right? So even though this guy is out here doing magic and making himself great, giving himself a name, somehow God still is associated to what they called him, the great power of God, right? But he doesn't uh, get any of these powers from God, any of these things that he was doing for these people. It came through sorcery, right? You would liken this kind of person today as, as guys like David Blaine, right? I don't know if everybody knows David Blaine, but he was one of these popular magicians out here in the streets. And he would go to the famous people's houses and he would also go to the people on the street and show them these things that he can do. All the while he receives the glory, right? And, God's, and God gets none. Okay, so we know what, how sorcery works. In, in, in sorcery, God doesn't get the glory. Okay, and so anyway, verse 11, it says, They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he had proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Right? So again, Philip's out here performing signs and wonders, preaching the gospel. What's the response of the people who believed? Right? They were baptized and they followed. Okay? They became believers, members of the faith. Right? They responded. This is their act of faith. Right? Because remember, the scripture said in the book of James, faith without works is dead. Right? So faith prompts you to action. You act upon it can't just say, well, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus Christ is real. Well, then what are you going to do about it? Jesus said, be baptized, every one of you. Jesus said, drink my blood and eat my flesh, right? Jesus said, wash each other's feet. Jesus said, forgive one another. Confess your sins to one another, right? Give to the needy. And, and, and on and on it goes. So if we are truly in this faith, that Jesus has given us, then it prompts us to action, right? And when we act upon it and not just so, yeah, it's there, but whatever, right? Anyway, and so it says, verse 13, Simon himself believed and was baptized. 
And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So even the sorcerer came, right? Got baptized and followed him because of the signs that he saw, right? So it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. All right, so now you're going to, not only do you have the man who's now pl like planting the seeds, but now you're going to have two other apostles come and water, water the ground, right? Just like the scripture says, one plants and the other waters, right? So now you got these two dudes coming to confirm that Samaria received the gospel. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, and so remember how the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, right? They said they had to wait after um, Jesus had gone up and then he set the Spirit down. And, and when they were in the upper room, it said the Spirit came on all of them, right? And then there was, a, there was the house of Cornelius, where Peter went and preached the gospel. And when, and when he preached, and as soon as the people believed, it said a spirit came down on all of them, right? And then they were baptized after the fact, right? But now these people, says they had received the truth, they got baptized in the name of Jesus, but they still hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And so you can see here, what God is doing is he's waiting for Peter and John to, to arrive and to pray for them and then allow these people to receive the Holy Spirit and have instruction from these apostles as to what as to how it goes from here. Okay, so there's a reason that God does everything the way that he does. We've seen the Holy Spirit coming upon men in different ways, right? And, the, and, and, and this being their spiritual baptism, but there's a reason that God allowed it to be done this way, that way, and the third way, right? So anyway, it says... Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so here's some insight about Steve, about Simon that we can pick up right now. If Simon is seeing this man perform a particular sign and he comes and says, yo, show me how to do it. I will pay you. It kind of gives you a glimpse into how he received all his other power, all his other gifts or whatever you want to call them, right? Because the way it works in sorcery, these people have to pay homage to other uh, sorcerers witches who are at a higher degree and then they take this secret knowledge from satan and and pass it to this proselyte so that their arts their evil arts can continue to thrive in whatever environment right but again they have to adhere to whatever rules and 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 uh the hurdles and, and hoops that these guys tell them to jump through you understand so you know, if they tell you you got to kill somebody and I, then I'll give you this, then you know it's a blood art that's being taught to you, right? And 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 again, you read the, the New Testament, you read the book of Acts, you're going to come to understand sorcery is real. Witchcraft is real. The word of God is talking about something that exists, okay? It's, n it's no longer a time for us to say, oh, well, I don't really believe in that stuff. Well, then, then you might not be believing in what the Holy Spirit is trying to share with you here. But if you're studying the word of God, you come to understand sorcery is real. And if sorcery is real, then it's not too surprising when we're watching TV, when we're watching movies and we see all these things going on, right? Or we hear about some wild stuff that's going on in the world, right? We now know like, yo, these things might be possible, man. Like when in the, in the days of Moses, when Moses went and, and, and Aaron went against Pharaoh, and Aaron had to lay the staff down, right? And it became a snake. The scripture said Pharaoh's magicians were able to do the same things. And they were able to somehow turn wa their water red. They were able to somehow produce other, other uh, signs and wonders that Moses had performed. 
And so keep in mind, when we're talking about these things, these are real. And Stephen just gave us some insight out of his own mouth how he acquired some of this power. He bought it off of these other dudes, other people who had the knowledge, right? And so anyway, so he says, you know, let me buy this gift of the Holy Spirit so that I can heal anyone or give anyone the spirit whom I put my hands on, right? And let's see what our apostle had to say in response to that. So Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you can buy the gift of God with money. All right, so that's clean, cut, shut, <laughs> shut down. All right, so it says, you have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Okay. And, and again, when you're seeing this right here, this is most likely why God did not give them the Holy Spirit initially, but, uh, but waited for Peter and John to arrive to have them do it at the laying on of hands so that this lesson right here can be communicated to the people. You understand? So anyway, 22, he says, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Okay, and so again, Simon was baptized. He believed, right? He came along, but it doesn't mean that now all of a sudden he, his thoughts were transformed and everything, all the, all the conduct and nature, right, that he had behaved in and practiced for so many years was just out the window like that. You know, God breaks the chains, right? Receiving the Holy Spirit breaks the chains of wickedness, the chains of sin that you were once bound to. And now it's up to you to abstain from those things that used to carry you off, those things that tempt you, right? The scripture says you're going to be tempted. The enemy's going to come and try to tempt you to do evil against God. But now God has given you the Holy Spirit by which you have power, right? To walk in obedience to God, to deny yourself, right? And also to, to turn away from whatever things, to run to the way of escape when God gives it to you, when temptation comes. Instead of entertaining temptation, God wants us to entertain him in prayer. And that's how we get out, right? So anyway, even giving this man the opportunity to repent is a great grace from God. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. It says, then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Okay, so again, remember how the Jews felt about the Samaritans, right? They, they did not associate at all. And here, once they saw Samaria receive Jesus, they were like, let's go, let's go. Okay. Because at first Jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Right. So it was, it, it was a occasion. He would help um, so a Samaritan or he would help a Roman. Right. But he wasn't able to go into those territories and be at full ministry. OK, because he had his focus, his ministry was focused on the people of Israel. That's how God was going to redeem the whole world. So he had to fulfill that plan. But now that Jesus fulfilled that plan, now the apostles can go to Samaria and preach the gospel out there and perform miraculous signs and wonders. Very awesome grace God is showing. So it says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road. The, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candate, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. Says this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So now we have an Ethiopian eunuch who is the treasurer of, uh, to the queen of Ethiopia, right? And you could see just by this, he's coming to Jerusalem to worship how far faith in God has spread 
to, to even foreign peoples in the region, okay? And when we, when we look at um, this place, Ethiopia, we're talking about uh, uh, the, this place could be also referred to as Sheba. And we had a queen of Sheba in the book of Kings with Solomon, right? And how Solomon had a child with her and that child grew up in those Southern territories. And again, she loved Solomon so much and came to know the God of Israel that she brought that faith back home. Okay, and so it's no wonder that there are Ethiopians who are worshiping the true God, right? But now look at what the Holy Spirit is doing. Sent an angel to Philip so that he can go after this guy, so that this important guy from Ethiopia can receive the gospel, receive the Holy Spirit, then go back to Ethiopia and spread it all over that country. So it's phenomenal stuff that you see happening here. All right, so anyway, it says verse 28. And on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stand near it. It says, then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself? or someone else. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Again, someone who just received Jesus Christ, right? Is saying, the Lord said, baptize us? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's some water right here. Let's go. Let's go. And so no hesitation. All right. So it says, and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. And so, you know, what you would call that, that's a disapparation, right? Um, we see that he was taken in the spirit, all right? Throughout scripture, we've seen a few other people who have been translated in the spirit. They were taken from one place and brought to another, okay? And so, and, and, it, and it's, it's awesome how Philip does what the Holy Spirit told him to do. And the Holy Spirit was like, all right, your job is done here. And just made this man vanish before the eyes of someone who just got baptized, you know? And so again, the works that God had done through his apostles were to authenticate them to everyone that they would go to so that people would, would not be able to deny that God was working through those men. They had the fingerprint, the seal of God on them. And this is why God worked miraculous signs and wonders through them, okay? And, and accompanying those signs with the gospel is what caused these people to believe with conviction, okay? And so we see this man believes and gets baptized right away. And then it says, Philip, however, appeared to Ozitus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea, okay? And so from there, Philip was like, the Holy Spirit brought him to Azotus, right? Or that's where he appeared. Some, you know, somebody saw him there or that's where he appeared. And then he started preaching the gospel from place to place. And so, you know, the thing, the theme that you can gather from, from these two chapters alone, is like, don't be afraid or hesitant to share your faith, especially in today's time, because the world is getting more evil and dark and the time is getting shorter. You know, we're absolutely certain. If these people thought that the Lord 
was coming soon. You know, how much more now are we at the end of the game? You know? And so, you know, we have a responsibility not to just pass people by, you know, and go about our lives as whatever, but to let them know, yo, there is a God who's going to require, right, uh, uh, an account of your life. So prepare yourself to meet him. And here's how. And share your faith. Share the gospel with people. You know what I mean? And when persecution comes, trust in the Lord, whether he gets you out or you have to suffer a death, no matter what it ha no matter what happens here, all right? The end result is that we go with the Lord, that we obey him, no matter what we face, okay? And so we're gonna leave it there for today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. God bless y'all. Scripture. Meditating on your scripture Lord Jesus, open up my mind Open up my mind Meditating on the scripture Meditating on your scripture Something new every single time And every single time Blessed are the ones who meditate upon the words of God And the ones who take to heart what is written in them Each one is like a seed, taking its time to grow But at the harvest, the fruit is all of that and then some Every line is full of knowledge and wisdom Helping you to uproot the lies of the system Equipping you for every good work in the kingdom Preparing you and yours for the arrival of his son Scripture, meditating on your scripture Lord Jesus, open up my mind, open up my mind, meditating on the scripture, meditating on your scripture, something new every single time, and every single time. Whenever I read, there's always something new to learn. You open my mind to things that only you discern. Mysteries of your death and resurrection revealed in every section. The text bears your reflection from your infancy to your ascension. From your second coming, even unto eternity with the brethren. See, line for line, you told it all before it happened. Starting from when Eve ate and gave some to Adam. And that's when he made the choice to lay his life down. But you cursed him, sweating his eyes, thorns in the ground. Then you versed him upon the prophecy of the Lord who would sweat blood and be adorned with a crown of thorns. And what that means is that you knew from the beginning that you would trade yourself as an offering for his sinning. And like Adam, you would have to bleed to provide the death of your seed for the life of the bride. Come on, scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind.